like to thank again to the team that organized the, the seminar, particularly to Sheila and, and, and Cesar. And of course, to you for joining, for joining us today. Uh, we believe that it's important to have this kind of event even under these global circumstances. My name is Aaron Verona. I'm a professor of the uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. And I will be the moderator of this panel along with my colleague, uh, Luciano Gonzalez of the University of Freiburg. We will be receiving your questions and comments to the panelists, uh, Professor Vladimir Aguilar and Sara Araujo, uh, whom I will have the pleasure to introduce. Uh, I, I should mention, however, that sadly, some technical issues related to the current situation at Venezuela have prevented Professor Aguilar from, from joining us today. Oh. Nevertheless, uh, he has sent in us a video prepared for, for this occasion. Uh, so I, I'm going to show you the video. Just uh, uh, let me make a short introduction about uh, Professor Aguilar, who is a political scientist and a lawyer of the Universidad de los Andes of Venezuela. And he holds, us, he holds a PhD in development studies with a mention on international relations of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies of the University of Geneva at Switzerland. Currently, he is a senior professor and researcher at the Faculty of Law and Political Science at the Universidad de los Andes, where he's in charge of, work, of the working group on indigenous affairs, and he is the coordinator of the Center of Political and Social Studies of Latin America. Additionally, he is a specialist on international relations from the Universidad Central de Venezuela. I will show you the, the video now, it's a short video, and then I will introduce uh, Professor Araujo, uh, is, is, if is that okay. I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, from Venezuela, I want to thank for inviting me to participate in this important event. In particular, I want to thank Sheila Fernandez for allowing me to be here with you. My presentation would be about access to justice and indigenous rights in the Amazon in time of pandemic case of the Venezuelan Amazon. To this end, I propose to contextualize the presentation in two fundamental parts. First three, the importance of the Amazon in the global context. And secondly, access to justice and the condition for this, for this to be possible in the context of the Amazonian indigenous people. The key idea here is what are the indigenous people of the Amazon doing regarding pandemic and what the authorities in charge, if, the, if they doing anything, and what other actors are involved, for example, the hegemonic interests, power prisons, Venezuelan militaries, etc. So, the first part, the question is, in the first part, what is the global, ecological, and historical importance of the Amazon, of the Amazon? The Amazon relevance, what about it? From an ecological and historical point of view, what is geopolitical meaning? What is the public policies in the Amazon? Who does them? Who defines them? Collective rights, what are they? What are the historical subjects that can vindicate them? How to make a bridge between public policies and collective rights is very important to contextualize the global ecological and historical importance of the Amazon. So the Amazon region is the largest tropical forest and fresh water source area in the world. Six million kilometers is composed by nine countries, including an European department, 
such as Brazil and Peru that have the largest territory in a realm of Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador, Guyana, and Venezuela, Suriname, and French Guyana. So this is the Europe map. This is the, the territory of France, for example. And you can see here in the line, yellow line, the Amazon region, six million kilometers. Nine countries, Suriname, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil. In the, this context of uh, the different country of the Amazon. And here you can see the Amazon rivers and the other rivers from the most important river in the world. So, the global ecological and historical importance of the Amazon from a cultural and biological point of view, the Amazon region is one of the most mega diverse regions on the planet. 33, 33 million people, including 385 native people, and approximately 22 people in voluntary isolation or initial contact. The indigenous people who inhabit the Amazon belong to various linguistic groups, according to Alfredo Warner, 180 indigenous language that have a wide variety of relationship between them. So we can, uh, we can see Tupi language are the most widespread native language read in the Amazon region. region. G -R -O -G language, Caribbean language, Arawak language, Pantacana in the southwest Amazon, and the Tuk Tukan language in the high course of the Amazon and high Valpes. So you can see here, for example, the Tupi language in the in the in Brazil, fundamental in the Brazil region, Arawak. We, uh, uh, we can see Arawak language in Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, uh, Brazil, and Bolivia, uh, Bolivian country. The Pano Tacanas uh, in uh, Bolivia um, and uh, um, Peru. Uh, the Macrodi in, in, in Brazil. So the cultural diversity, identity, and words 19 indigenous people, nation with language, nationality, traditions, indigenous organization, worldview, and territory. Where are we at the level of protection of the Amazon? Higher rates of deforestation, loss of biodiversity, no public environmental policies, inconsistencies of protect areas and environmental viola violation and the absence of territorial indigenous demarcation. So you can see here in the purple color is the borderline and the area of deforestation. In the brown color you can see the territories, indigenous territories in the Amazon and in the green color you can see the protector protected areas. So, the Amazon overcoming structures. For us, the structures is the uh, principal threat of the Venezuelan Amazon. Historically, this is due to the expanding economic and commercial interests, the colonial character of the position and occupation of land to systematically exploit natural resources in the territory of indigenous peoples. Consolidation of a policy of disproportionate mining expansion in the Amazon foods illegal and after legal now that has been proportional to the devastation of indigenous territories. Another phenomenon has been the persistence of the notion of Amazonian risk nullions. 
So the condition to, of access to justice in the Amazon for indigenous people in the Amazon region is mainly related to the recognition of indigenous territories. The guarantee of the first right, right of, of, the, of access to justice passes through the right of territory. For this purpose, the Amazonian state must be guarantor for all ancestral and traditional institutions that the indigenous peoples and community have in accordance with their custom and above all the right and system of self-justice. The right to recognition of its own system remains a right pending in most Amazonian countries and is therefore an obligation of the state to create the condition for their exercise. Within the framework of the current pandemic and in the face of the vulnerability and risk of the indigenous people of the Amazon, the right of access to justice and the right to territory are two crucial goals to achieve. Alongside to what is mentioned above, the moratorium and extractive project in their ancestral and traditional territories is essential since it affects by causing a kind of silent cultural genocide, according Bartolome Clavero. It's very important to build an indigenous agenda for Amazon. Interculturality is part of the democracy project to be made <clears throat> in the country. The more interculturally it's the same, or it's very important to build the more democracy. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Now we're going with the presentation of Professor Araujo. Let me to, to make also a, a short introduction. Uh, Professor Araujo is a researcher at the Center of, uh, for Social Studies, the CA, CES, and invited assistant professor in sociology at the Faculty of Economics of the University of Coimbra. And she holds a PhD in law, justice, and citizenship in the 21st century. She is one of the coordinators of the epistemologies of the South Summer School, part of the research program of the same name at the Center for, so for Social Studies aforementioned. Additionally, she is a member of the collective that coordinates the popular University of Social Movements in Europe and has been a, se and has been a senior researcher at the European, European project Ethos toward, towards a European theory of justice and fairness. The title of her presentation is The European Project, the Legal Abyssal Lines and the COVID-19 Crisis, Justice for Whom. Uh, Professor Araujo, you hold the floor. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Heron. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, it is really a great pleasure to be part of this panel. I want to thank everyone involved in the organization of this uh, uh, event and a special thanks to Sheila and Cesar for all the work you have done and for the invitation. I'm just going to put here my time so I will not exaggerate. Well. Um, I was asked to talk about access to justice and the pandemic crisis with no further requests. Uh, I will not talking about uh, access to justice courts or legal aid, and I will be moving in a sphere that makes me feel very much comfortable, and it's, it, it is that sphere that stands between sociology of law and political sociology. Um, I want to talk about social justice in Europe, uh, but using a post-colonialist frame focusing on the exclusions in the context of the coronavirus pandemics. Um, in order to understand the global picture, I will talk a lot about power in this uh, presentation. Uh, my approach will lead me into the recent wave of Black Lives Matter protests, and hopefully at the end, 
this will all make sense together and uh, you will not think that I moved between too many different spheres and different things because I think they all come together and they are connected and we must connect the explanations. Um, as I said, I will focus on social justice and I will take for serious uh, one of the premises of the epistemologies of the South proposal that says that there is no social justice without cognitive justice. Um, for those who are not familiar with the epistemologies of the South approach, I will give just some brief words. Uh, it is an uh, epistemological and political proposal uh, of the legal sociologist Boaventura de Souza Santos that invites social sciences to reformulate the way they approach the world in order to enlarge the visible field and the narratives taken into account. Um, so this is a post-colonial proposal. The South uh, in this proposal is not a geography. And I'm emphasizing this because this is a common misconception about the epistemologies of the South. The South here is uh, a metaphor for the knowledge that it's born out of the suffering and resistance against the three main modes of modern oppression. And they are capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. So the epistemologies of the South are not only relevant for those who work or struggle or live in the geographical South, uh, not only Europe has a lot to learn from the geographical South, but also there is many South in Europe. Uh, there is many knowledge and bodies that are disposable inside Europe and they are crucial to think and to struggle for justice in order to build a better society. I hope I will make this clear during my uh, presentation. Um, the way I'm looking to the pandemics here is as a breaching experiment, a cruel breaching experiment that allow us to see the lines of inequalities in a more clear way. Uh, the bridging experiment, it is uh, an uh, unexpected interruption to normality that it's used to observe how people react. It is a not very known instrument. It was used by ethnomethodologists. Uh, the most famous one was Arl Garfinkel. In order, it was used in order to unveil social norms that we use, but that we are not aware that we are using it. Uh, it, is supposed, it is not supposed to be something dramatic like this. Uh, it is supposed to be something like giving a long answer to a, polite, to a polite greeting, how are you? Uh, so it's something that breaks with the normality so we will really understand what normality is made of. As I said, the pandemics, it is a very cool, cruel breaching experiment. But in fact, what we are seeing with the pandemics is the exposure and the reinforcement of the cruel normality of the social contract. And I'm here focusing in Europe, but we can think about this uh, in different, from, different, from different places. Uh, it is obvious that since the beginning, and it, it was said by many people that since the beginning of the pandemics, these pandemics means different things to different people. And it is not that the virus affects people differently. Our societies protect people uh, differently. So uh, inequalities are now very well exposed, or at least are much better exposed now. Uh, we all know that, this, that the, the effects of the pandemics they have been worse for women. Uh, we saw the rise of the numbers of domestic, of domestic violence, the rise of numbers of feminicide. We saw the extra burden on women as they assumed the main part of the care, of the care work. We saw the higher levels of, unemp of unemployment affecting uh, more uh, women uh, than men. Uh, the pandemics and the effects of the pandemics have been worse for racialized people, for migrants, for the most precarious, for those who live in the peripheries of the cities and do the jobs that never stop and cannot be, not, and cannot be replaced by digital work. These people from the peripheries, even when we were uh, in Europe uh, in this emergency state, they continued to go to work, they continued to have public transportation, they, got, uh, they continued to do the job that it was uh, required, and uh, they were much ex very much exposed uh, to, to, to the virus. Um, so the, the question is, is this new, uh, or is it just uh, Europe? 
uh, inequalities did not appear now. They did not appear by chance against women, against, against black people, against Roma communities, against refugee, against precarious young, 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 young workers. I recently participated, and it was said in the presentation, in a project called Hethos that discussed justice in the European Union from different perspectives and disciplines. And among other studies, I worked on a report on distributive justice and social justice after the subprime crisis. And the study shows that the one-size-fits-all austerity measures that were implemented in the European Union after 2010, particularly, they had very different effects uh, they deepened the inequalities between countries, but also uh, they uh, emphasized the cross-country inequalities. Some groups were much more exposed uh, to the effects of the crisis, of 2008 crisis, than others. Some groups were much more exposed to the effects of the austerity than others. And it is also the same that we are watching uh, uh, now. So, we cannot understand the dynamics of access to justice if we can't understand inequalities and we can't understand inequalities without discussing structures of power and oppression. Uh, this means we must speak about patriarchy or heteropatriarchy if we want, colonialism and neoliberal capitalism. And we can't discuss the effects of pandemics in Europe without discussing how these systems of oppression, how they permeate the European social model. This common project that uh, in rhetorics is grounded on the ideas of solidarity, equality and social uh, cohesion. But in 2017, the head of the Eurozone's finance minister said that the southern countries in which Portugal was included had wasted all their money before the crisis of 2008 on drinks and women. And I am quoting for the ones who are not from Europe, probably are not aware of this, this was pretty much discussed, but he said that we in the south had spent our money in drinks and women. So in one sentence, and I, and I choose, I know it was one person that said it, but this is one sentence uh, that shows um, how complex uh, Europe is and shows what the superiority complex of Europe is made of. It is built in a, such a small sentence, you can see the colonial matrix that creates hierarchies between countries. You can see capitalism because what people are saying is that southern countries were expanding more than they have. So it doesn't care if expanding more, it was expanding in order to survive, in order not to die. But it doesn't matter because that's what capitalism says. You don't have, you don't spend it. So the ideas of European solidarity, they just disappear uh, in, the, in, in this moment. And a very shocking and explicit sexism that is implicit in that, in that sentence when you say that uh, people, just men, they spend, they spend money on drinks and they spend money on women. So uh, even the discussion now when we are discussing how are we going to get out of the crisis and the corona bonds are being discussed, we are again coming with these hierarchies uh, between countries and with these, uh, 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 and these narratives always impregnated with these systems of, uh, uh, of oppression. So uh, I, I, I'm not going, I, 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 I'm entering now in the sociology of law uh, that I bring here to discuss with you, and I will resort to a concept that Boventura de Sousa Santos used in the 90s, and it is the concept of the three circles of the civil society, and I will now try to share my, um, my monitor. Let me see. Can you, can you see me? Can you see my, my screen? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you can, because <laughs> I can't listen to you. So um, what I said is I, I'm going to, to work with this concept of Boventura, that is the three circles of, uh, of civil society. And this is a concept that he doesn't use it anymore, but I will try to work with it together with another more recent concept that he used, that is the concept of the abyssal eye. So uh, this concept says that civil society is divided in three circles. The circle, the inside circle is the intimate civil society that it's composed by citizens that are very close 
to the state and they can impose some rules and some laws. It is a, a, an, intimate, an intimate sphere. And then you have the strange civil society. This is the people that are not that close to the state, but they are inside of the social contract. They, can, they have mechanisms and maybe for them in certain circumstances, law can be emancipatory. And then you have the uncivil civil society. And it's here that I come with these uncivil civil societies is what Boventura today calls the other side of the line. So, uh, and this is, this is important and this is complex, but hopefully I can explain it uh, in a simple way. The Ebisa line, it is the line that divides the metropole from the colonial zones. Uh, on the other side of the line, so this circle of the uncivil civil societies, if you are familiar with Franz Fanon, you will recognize this, it is the zone of non-being. This Ebisa line is an ontological and an epistemological line. So what happens on the other side of the line, it's not news, it's not seen. Uh, it's the zone of subhumanity, it's the, colonial, it's the colonial zone. So there is no modern social contract here. So my argument here is that Europe has inside Europe this colonial zone also. This is not just a division of the, that was a part of the political, uh, when the colonialism uh, uh, was a political, a political thing, so we have a continuity of colonialism, but this colonialism also exists inside of the European country. So in this zone of non-being, we can find what Mahmoud Mamdani called in Africa, the bifurcated state. And my argument is that the bifurcated state also happens in Europe when you have the first class citizens that have access to law, that have access to social contracts, and then you have the second class uh, uh, citizens. But I also come with another argument here, is that on the other, the other side of the line, is the, it's, this is an ontological line, but also an epistemological. And this is a Boaventura's argument. That is, you don't have only suffering, you don't have only subhumanity, you also have knowledge, and you also have law. So what I'm working here with is also with the concept of legal pluralism. Uh, and what you have, it's the law of the oppressed. Law of the oppressed was also a concept of Boaventura that he used when he did the, a work in the 70s in the communities and peripheries of Rio de Janeiro, in the favelas of, in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, Passargada, and where he saw some law that were parallel to the uh, official law, and it was the law that could uh, uh, maybe be transformative and have some different ideas to transform the world. And this is also a concept that you will find that for the ones who are from Latin America will be familiar with this, is the law found on the streets. Uh, there is a concept of Roberto Lira Filho. It is said in Portuguese, uh, this is a Brazilian uh, concept, Direito uh, Achado na Rua, that is precisely the law that uh, people use in order to transform a, 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 a society. So what we are seeing this is a plurality of, of is, is a legal pluralism with a dispute of power between different forms of law because you have the law of the intimates, you have the strange civil society in, in which the contract, uh, the social contract works. So you have the state law, and then you have this. Uh, this other uh, uh, category, this other sphere of laws, and in the end, this is a plurality, not only of law, but maps of legal imagination that allow us to think about the world. So, uh, this is, uh, I, I'm moving back, um, I will stop uh, the, the interest, the, the interest. Uh, uh, to, in order to continue, as this legal pluralism develops under very unequal power relations, the excluded have to formulate their claims in the language of the modern law, meaning they have to respect the norms of a social contract that does not include them. When we ask if law can be emancipatory and we say yes under circumstances, we must say that under some circumstances for citizens that are on this side of the line, for citizens who are committed to the terms and which are included in the social contract and want to commit to the terms that are defined on this side of the line. If we want to talk about access to justice in Europe and access to justice in this moment of pandemics, 
we need to make a sociology of absences, again, above into this concept uh, of our theories, our questions, our concepts. Because, uh, again, using this example, maybe we should not ask, can law be emancipatory? We should ask, can law be post-colonial? Can law be post-abyssal? Uh, can law uh, include, can we renegotiate the social contract? Not only to include, because that is the, uh, the rhetoric of Europe. It's always, people need to be included, we are going to integrate. But uh, what, who defines the terms uh, of the integration? So there are a lot of questions that, we need to do, and maybe a lot of questions that are done, that were done in, uh, uh, in the, now I'm talking about geographical south, must be also asked uh, uh, in Europe because there's a lot of colonialism uh, in, inside Europe. So, um, how much has the concept, um, how much has excluded the concept of civil society by not seeing this other side uh, of the line. So we need to listen to the Black Lives Matter movement and we need to understand why the statues are coming down because this is all connected. Is it illegal to have the statues coming down? Yes, but is it more illegal than racism? Is it more illegal uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than violence? Uh, why does the anti-racist struggle should express themselves on the terms of a social contract that does not apply to them or on the terms of a rule of law that kills them? So we always put the rule of law above everything, but maybe we need to renegotiate it because how much of that rule of law was created and started uh, by a group of people? Uh, it was considered universal, but it was mainly discussed by white men uh, in a certain part of the world and then export it to, ev to everywhere else. And maybe the discussion is happen in the geographical south, but I think that Europe also needs to make that, to make, to make that question. We need to negotiate the, the own terms of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the rule of law. So um, in order to achieve social justice, we need to be able to accept that modern institutes modern narratives, modern rule of law. It's not the end of story. It was something that started, there's a lot of good things. And I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that state doesn't matter or rule of law doesn't matter. What I want to say, it's very much incomplete. And the way we can complete it is not just by having something, is, that, is it by discussing its, its own terms, uh, discussing who created them, how create them, and try to uh, make a discussion that it's not a discussion that is always moderated by some superiority of uh, rules that uh, are never uh, that 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 are never that are never discussed. So we need to reduce colonial hierarchies. We need to end up with colonial hierarchies that impose hierarchies on knowledge. Uh, so the knowledge in the universities, the knowledge that we are creating in, in the law, uh, the knowledge that we are uh, developing, we need to discuss them with the people that are in the streets saying that black lives matter because they are uh, going so much further uh, going to the streets and with these than probably the sociology of law did in so many years of, uh, of, uh, of, of work and presentations. And I'm not devaluing our work, uh, which I pretty much appreciate. I'm saying that it's really time to produce an ecology of knowledge. And this is one of the main terms of epistemologies of the South is it sciences and completes so uh, we need to work with other forms of knowledge in an horizontal way it's not that science doesn't matter science is important but it needs to be discussing with communities in an horizontal way so this is what it means uh, to say that there is no social justice without cognitive justice because we need to accept this horizontality in order to discuss what it means to have social justice. It's not just opening to more people, it's discussing its own terms of what social justice is. And this is my main point. Thank you very much. Alan, your microphone is closed. Hey, okay. 
thank you very much, uh, Sara. It's a very, very interesting presentation. A lot of, a lot of issues to talk about. Uh, please remember uh, that if you want to, to participate, you can use uh, the chat box or you can raise your hands. There is a button. Uh, there is a button at the bottom of the right column that opens when you click the the option particip participates or uh, participants. Sorry. Uh, uh, well, the, the the debate is open. If you want to. If you want to make a question, if you want to make a comment, maybe it's up to you. Probably, if you allow me uh, to make a, a, a brief comment, I think it's, it's very easy to integrate bo both presentations because that song of not being that, that provocative concept of Panon. Uh, which referred to the modern condition of being a citizen, uh, citizens, uh, citizens, and have actual equal rights, is where you normally could put the, the, the indigenous people, uh, well, because of the of the of the actual condition of, of this group in Latin America, for example, in Peru, uh, we haven't protocols. And, and uh, in, in the context of the, of the emergency, of the sanitary emergency, we, we haven't protocols uh, for for treat or for for to 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 make a a, a communication or, 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 or contact with with indigenous indigenous people uh, uh, until the 70, 70 days after the the. the the emergency uh, starts, so, and and this and these protocols were at the same time with the resignation of our of our minister of, of culture. So uh, we have a crisis of the minister that uh, holds the, the the issues about indigenous people, and uh, after seventy days, we all, we only have the, the the correct protocols to 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 assist these people. So there there was an, there was a uh, a clear difference in the treatment of regular uh, uh, regular citizens citizens and indigenous people mm -hmm. just in the same country not not only between the the, the north and the south but in in the the, the same uh, nation state uh, well I, I i i don't know i don't want to 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 talk too much so if, if anyone have a, a question or a comment, it would be great. Can I, can I just uh, reply to you? If, if, I, if someone wants to speak, you just tell me about... Uh, yeah, yes, of course. Because of course, I, I, um, it's hard to be so concrete in 20 minutes because there was a lot of a theoretical thing in this. So I think sometimes we miss the, the, the cases. But I did a lot of work, well, not a lot of work, I did some work, I should have done more actually because uh, usually projects are too short, uh, with the Roma communities. And uh, I remember listening to a speech that I, I thought it was one of the most amazing post-colonial speech I've ever seen. I have ever listened to, it was of uh, Roma uh, activists. And uh, it was from uh, 20, um, 2010, I think, uh, 2010 and uh, 2011. It was after the austerity measures in Europe and things were really complicated and people were coming out protesting in the street and the consequences like the Occupy and the Indignados and also in Portugal we had the uh, comparable movements. And, uh, and it was saying something like, uh, well, you are worried because the constitution says that we have, since 75, the constitution says, since 76, the constitution says that we all have rights to health, to education, to housing, and to uh, labor rights. And now you are coming to the streets four decades after the democracy being implemented, and you are complaining because suddenly you realize that you have no housing, that you are going to the peripheries, but I want to tell you something. The Constitution was always wordless for me. He said, because for me, as a Roma citizen, I have never had access to housing, I have never had access to school. I was always excluding from that social contract that we are so 
a problem. So now you want to, uh, you want me to say that gentrification, for instance, is a problem. The peripherization of people is a reality since the beginning of democracy. The only difference now is that white people are going to the to the peripheries because black people and Roman people have always been there, and there. That was not a problem uh, before. Uh, that was not a problem. Uh, problem before. So this is what the abyssal line means. This is what it's the invisibilization of certain bodies. This is the invisibilization of certain uh, of certain knowledge. The invisibilization of certain um, uh, 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 of certain uh, uh, of certain struggles uh, and the over visibilization of, of others. So this is not so much different uh, uh, when we talk about indigenous people. The, the, the idea is more or less the same, obviously, with all the difference that exists and, and, and we know, but that is the group of people that are invisibilized, whose knowledge doesn't, doesn't matter and should be very much important. And the previous presentation, the video, we saw, we saw that, how important it is the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge to, 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 to build, to, to preserve the Amazonia, how important it would be the Roma culture or the so many cultures in Europe uh, in order to build a really a better, a better society. But uh, they are just said as identity things. They are not taken into account when we are talking about things like political economy, uh, like state, uh, like state, like rule of law and all those things. And that's what, that is what I'm arguing is that no, it is not just a political thing, an identity thing. It's this, we should be this politically discussing with everyone and not just a few groups that think like, uh, like us. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, we have a question. Yes, we have a question, please, from Carmen Nunez Borja. Nunez Borja. Uh, we're going to, to activate your, your microphone, please. Uh, okay. It's already Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon from Brussels. Um, Sara, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very, very refreshing because I think that from scholars that belong to the geographical self, to combine concepts like coloniality of power developed by Aníbal Quijano or epistemologies of the South developed by uh, the Sousa Santos really reflect the experiences and the uh, research we focus on. So maybe that's why uh, most of the things you said have really resonated uh, on my thinking on the past uh, months under the, the, the pandemics. And uh, I would like to uh, profit from the opportunity of having you here. <laughs> and I would like you to expand a little more on the issue of, because you also mentioned Franz Fanon, uh, the issue of power related to the body. You know, the body now, the body citizen is the one who is containing the social unrest. The body citizen is now the one that contains that virus, right? And we have come to realize that for Europe, especially uh, this week with all this um, news about uh, hospitals taking the decisions, patients coming from uh, homes uh, for, for the elderly, we know that the idea of disposability of the body has come to real more than ever. So I would like you to reflect a little bit of this interconnectedness between the power, the body, and the surveillance technologies that are going to follow and going to be implemented in the coming uh, months. Not only applications, but the surveillance technology when we want to cross a border, when we want to access a public space, and even when we want to speak. If we take your example of the movement Black, Black Lives Matter, there is already, already a surveillance instrument in place. So as a Black person, or as a person who comes from the periphery, or as a person who comes from the precariousness of society, we are already considered as the rebel who wants to speak so I just want to hear you about that. <laughs> yes, I disappoint you because uh, I have co colleagues that are, uh, and, and I can give you more references after because I have colleagues that are really developing the epistemologies of the South and they are developed with this relation 
uh, with, the, uh, with the body. Uh, so I, I can tell you a few things, but I will be also speaking out loud. Uh, I think this uh, Black Lives Matter, um, it's really challenging for, for society and it's challenging in a society and social media and we have talked about it with before and it must be something that we really need to bring to our discussions because we cannot be apart from what is happening uh, in uh, in social media and the body is a very important thing the only people who believe that body is not an important thing are the ones who have the canon body that was defined by a neurocentric idea of what the body is so uh, with Franz Fanon and also with his idea of the Ebisa line and uh, just just a small note uh, Boaventura's colonialism uh, is it's not much different from Anibal Quijano colonialidad uh, the only thing is that Boaventura says that uh, it didn't change colonialism can it used to be colonialist so we should not call it coloniality it should be uh, col col colonialism so this Ebisa line as I say it's that it's an epistemological and an ontological uh, line, and, and we can say that it is a body, that it is a line that puts our body in one place and makes our body more visible or less, uh, or, or or less, uh, or, or or less, or less visible. So, of course, all the violence, all the things they are lived. Uh, they are lived in the body. We are not uh, this idea of, uh, of souls. We have a body. We, we have a body that uh, receives violence and physical violence on there, psychological violence on them. And it might be less or more disposable according to which is with the norms or not uh, with the norms is in one side of the line or outside uh, of the line. And this is very much important when we talk about racism. Because when we situate it on the body, we see that it is not just a class, a question of class. Uh, the same, when, 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 it, when we put it on body, we, we can see that it's not just a question of, uh, uh, that patriarchy is, very, is, very, is still very, very strong because what we are talking obviously is society, but it's bodies that are targeted to violence more uh, than, uh, uh, than the others. Uh, but then I, I would like also to, and, and, and I tell you, uh, I wish I could uh, develop these, these, uh, these more in my reflections, that it's the body not just as the receptor of violence, but the body as uh, uh, the sphere of resistance. Uh, the body that uh, demands for pleasure, the body that's the, that is in the struggle, uh, the body that feeds himself not of this uh, uh, Western-centric idea of guilt, uh, but uh, uh, that uh, is allowed to a party, it's allowed to, to pleasure, and it is the way it reinforces and it strengthens it in, from inside in order to go uh, 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 to the struggle. So there are a lot of discussions here about the body, that it's not only the body as a, as a space of violence, but as a sphere of resistance that I really appreciate and that I would like to have people developing developing that and to read about it. And there's a lot of people that are doing that. I, 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 I'm not sure if I went just through the reflection that you wanted, but it is what I can give you uh, uh, right now <laughs> at, this, at this moment. Um, Sara? Yes. Uh, if no one has any questions, uh, I would like to also have a, a very quick question. It was very interesting, the theoretical and concrete framework. Uh, and I have like a, a question for you regarding the need to reduce this higher hierarchy of knowledge and colonialism. Uh, but I, I, I feel that there is a, like a previous stage that especially in Europe there is missing, there is this acknowledging of this colonialism or uh, this colonial structure and that is especially first in one state that is ignorance based on a systemic lack of uh, education especially in the education system whether in the schools and universities and when there's no ignorance there's also a stage i would call denial like even deny even the, when the, the the things are in, right in front of you, people tend to also deny that. And as I, what I feel 
especially when you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement, is that uh, it needed to go to this point to even rioting, uh, to almost like the system acknowledging, uh, uh, reckoning, uh, how, reckoning how bad the, the situation, the problem is. Um, how how are, are you insights of, of this uh, need to acknowledge first the, the problem? Yeah, it's 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 difficult, uh, obviously, and uh, and it's difficult because, um, for instance, in Europe you see in the last ten years uh, a lot of uh, things going worse uh, for people. Uh, the measures that were implemented uh, after 2010, uh, they were, we have a, a growth of neoliberalization of Europe. And people's lives are getting worse. And even the rectory is that the crisis is uh, over, but now we have a new one. So what we see is uh, since the 70s, we have a growing neoliberaliza neoliberalization uh, of, uh, of, of Europe. And now people see that comparing with the, how they were in the 90s or even the beginning of, uh, of, the, of the century, people are getting worse. So they see themselves getting closer to the excluded of society. If you look at this from the perspective of the intermediate circle, people are getting closer to the, to the external circle. And what people are doing and what, what the populist discourses, right-wing populist discourse are doing is that they defined as the scapegoat, the people that are on the other side of the line. And this narrative is much more easy to impose than the other narrative, that it's not that that it's happening. What is happening is that your rights are being taken. What is happening is that uh, financial marketings are kidnapping democracies. But this is very much difficult to explain because the, the worst of the colonialism is that you don't have politics you have science because you don't discuss financial markets because that is said that uh, that, that is not political economy that it's technicalities so science says that uh, this idea that there is no alternatives there is no alternatives according to one sort of narrative the problem is that narrative is sold as if it was the only possible one as if it was not a political choice and that is exactly what uh, a colonialist what colonialism of knowledge is is to say that the knowledge that it's coming from these white men economists that comes to our tv and they come with the scientific ideas about what technicalities of the economies are they cannot be discussed because there is no other way so when you are talking about Black Lives Matter, when you are talking about uh, alternatives to this sort of economy, when you talk about the uh, solidarity economy, when you talk about other economies, other democracies, those are the ones that are crazy uh, because they are not saying, because they are, they, they are, they are saying things that they are not uh, uh, approved by the by the universities, by the mainstream universities, by the main centers uh, of knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge inside Europe uh, that it's political choice that is presented as the only possible knowledge. Uh, Neoliberalization is not for the most of people. Uh, you have that sentence that it's very very old, but it's even it's very much applied. It's like you don't you 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 will see better the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Uh, so that is uh, what people think because uh, it is really believed that capitalism is the only, and neoliberal capitalism is the only possible way for the society to go. And that it's called uh, colonial thought, that it's called colonial science, that it's called colonial, col col colonial thinking. And it's very, very difficult to change it because uh, for instance, in this discussion of the status and uh, all the things that are coming now, uh, and people are, we were, th we, 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 we were thought since we were young that um, that statues were okay, that those men were our saviors, that, the, uh, and here in Portugal is pretty much uh, the, 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 our books for, for kids in the school still talk about the great adventures of the Portuguese people in the world and how good we were in civilizing, by civilizing people. So there is still the knowledge that it's being raised uh, inside the, uh, 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 of, uh, of the countries. And this is like this 
biggest examples, but everything that we, we learn, it's like one version of reality that it's sold as the only possible one, as the best, as, 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 as the best one. And I think that that thing happens everywhere in the world, but it's much more challenged in the southern countries that is in Europe, because people in Europe say, okay, it's Eurocentric thought, but I'm European, so it's fine, uh, even the most progressive ones. But no, it's not, because Europe is not made just of that. We, we have our own colonization, inside colonization. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm taking too long from the questions because it's, it, it's, it's difficult in this model. <laughs> I don't see it with people's face, so I just keep talking. Yes, now we have a question from Dr. Sumant. I will give him yeah. permission to talk. Um, there we go. Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Well, now I'm not listening. Uh, I would, uh, Chris, my question, I just want to know how, how does the sociology bring to the situation, the, the present uh, COVID-19 situation, especially in India and globally? Because if you see the statistics uh, as of in the COVID-19 in, uh, positive cases, India is very rapidly growing to the top slot. So how uh, serious issues uh, uh, how the uh, the serious issues are arising day by day, and how uh, can you uh, say that with, through uh, your research? How can we frame the policies towards uh, the current uh, in 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 seeing the current conditions in India and in general globally? Well, maybe you would be, I don't know, do you want to talk us a little bit about that? Uh, uh, I don't know that, what, what I know about what is happening in India was what I see um, in the news. I, 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 would, I would really like to, 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 maybe if you want to talk something, we can, we can comment, but uh, I, I'm not sure if I would give you an accurate answer because I, I don't know that much about that. I don't know, maybe other people in the, in the room uh, know more and maybe want to, to, to say something about that, that would be great. But Suman, if you want to, c can you develop a little bit more what you what you are thinking about that, and maybe we can interact then. Uh, any uh, fast track of policies towards the uh, current situations, so that uh, we uh, do frame the policies uh, only after uh, such pandemic is uh, gets over but that doesn't help to the current conditions. So the policies are there, uh, such policies should be framed where we can uh, implement it uh, immediately in such conditions, uh, because uh, it helps a lot many people in such conditions than the after the, the post pandemic or the post pandemic uh, situation is over. Okay, so what you are telling me, okay, how do I see the, I'm not sure if I if I really understood, but uh, you interrupt me whenever you want and uh, just uh, draw me back to 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 uh, because I remember. Uh, do you know the the Naomi Klein book the and the documentary the uh, doctrine shock doctrine I think shocking doctrine uh, that it's precisely and it's something that uh, we didn't discuss that much uh, uh, today and it, it it seems to me it is an important thing is when you have a crisis. Uh, the crisis has been used, and she starts the documentary with the example of Schill and uh, the coming down of Pinochet and the implementation of the Friedman, uh, Friedman uh, uh, project of neoliberalization. So our argument is that uh, the situations of crisis can be used in order to impose uh, 
uh, more dramatic uh, forms of uh, neoliberal capitalism, uh, in the sense that I'm not sure if it is this that 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 you wanted to talk about to discuss, but the idea is. When you have a crisis, as it was in Chile uh, uh, in the 70s, and then as it was in the Katrina's, uh, after, after Katrina's in the United States, or after the tsunami in the uh, Western, uh, uh, in the Eastern, um, she says that these uh, crises were used because people are in shock, and when you are in shock, you are much more available to accept everything. And we have discussed before, and uh, it, it, it has been discussed the things about uh, uh, how we are controlled now. And uh, the previous uh, the previous question was also 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 about health. All the things that are being implemented in order to reply uh, to the situation of the pandemic crisis. But the thing is, we need answers because we are in crisis and we are in shock, and we, no one really knows what to do. But many times this is is used in order to impose uh, more privatization, in order to impose uh, the privatization of schools, the privatization of health. So a lot of things that uh, will not end when the crisis uh, comes, uh, comes to an end. I am not that familiar with the situation in India. Actually, I'm quite curious and I've heard something about it, but I, I, I do not dare to discuss it because uh, I, I must say some, uh, something that, 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 is, that, that, that is not true. So, uh, but I think this is this is my, this might be a problem uh, everywhere in the world for which we social scientists and we citizens and activists, the ones who are, uh, need to be pretty much uh, uh, attentive because, yeah, there is a possibility that there are a lot of measures that are coming to stay, and the surveillance is one of the one of the big uh, of, 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 of the big problems about being 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 being, being controlled. Yes. It can be used this moment in order to make it worse for societies after it politically. And in fact, it was the Angaman's uh, uh, argument in the beginning, which was, uh, which I was pretty critical of it when he talked about the state of exception and how how is how is it going to uh, to 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 get deepen our these surveillance uh, uh, things and create this idea of a state of, of a permanent state of uh, of exception. Uh, obviously, it, it was not that right in the sense that uh, uh, what happened in, uh, in Italy uh, and the, the number of deaths that, that there there was there. Yes, the, there was some measures that really needed uh, to be taken uh, by then. But uh, we are always. Uh, needing to think about these these things we need to think about that uh, what is coming to reply to the pandemics but the things that are going to continue after the, the crisis is, is, is finished we can hear you Aaron we can't your microphone again Okay, thank you very much, Sara. Um, uh, thank you for, for the questions, thank you for the comments. It's been a very interesting uh, first day of the seminar. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have any more time, but remember that this is just the first day, so uh, we hope to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we have uh, three, three panels, one about uh, gender violence, uh, enforcement and punishment, and a close um, conference regarding the, the role of uh, sociologists of law uh, in, in, in these circumstances. You can use the same link to, to join us tomorrow. Thanks again to, to the organizers, to the panelists, and, anyone, and to any one of you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Aaron.